I must say that from this perch, gazing out over all of you and your finery, that the scarlet of Boston University never looked more splendid. Dean Hutter, esteemed faculty, beloved friends and families, and most especially doctoral and postdoctoral students and residents soon to be graduates. It is indeed a rare honor for one to be given the privilege of speaking to such an august gathering on such an auspicious day of accomplishment and celebration. I am both grateful and profoundly moved that so many of you felt me worthy to do so. You who have come to know me, know me as a man who has lived two devotions, one as a dentist, the other as a poet. When Dean Hutter asked me to deliver this address, I could not help but wonder whether I was being asked because I was a dentist who also happened to be a poet, or because I was a poet who also happened to be a dentist. In actuality, it strikes me that it was very possibly for neither of those reasons. I've come to believe it was because I was a teacher, a title I had never imagined might be accorded me. I have been a man who, all of my life, determined and humbled by the understanding of how very much I did not know, placed teachers on a pedestal which seemed far too lofty to be reachable by the likes of me. As a man who loved learning and the acquisition of knowledge and understanding, it was the teacher who willed me to learn, to know, and to understand. As a man with aspirations which might well have exceeded ability, it was the teacher who willed me to apply myself and to dream. As a man ever desirous of insight and wisdom, it was always the teacher who was the percipient, the wise. I have always thought that it should there be one day something poignant chiseled below my name on a granite stone to say, not what I had done, but who I had been. I had long thought that the word poet would suffice. I now believe that it must be two words, poet and teacher. To make a worthy effort at such an address as this, despite what one might imagine, the poet is at a decided disadvantage. Where language is invoked, the poet lives with the highest expectations. Where a person attempts to compose an address to a distinguished convocation such as this, a good place to begin is with a book of quotations, wisdoms and wit and aphorisms that will serve as the pillars of one's intentions and ideas. However, the poet, by his very nature, does not solicit quotes. He rather aspires to be quoted. He does not hope to recite or translate the wisdom of others, but to cultivate experience and insight and render wisdom. And so my task has not been trivial, for I must assume the solemn responsibilities of being the last of all the people who have taught you over the more than 20 years of your education to articulate words which will set you on your way into the world. In my life as a poet, I've been most fortunate to have come to know many interesting and accomplished artists, people who have realized within themselves a voice which compelled expression and a passion which needed to be gratified. Exceptional people who have been gifted with the preternatural ability to create beauty and who spent lifetimes exploring the nature of light and the depths of the darkness. What they discovered, they expressed in colors and shapes and sounds and syllables. It has long been my belief that the true nature of art is simply one person's celebration of the simple joy of being alive. By the artist's words and images and notes, we feel more fully alive. My own work at its most fundamental is my conversation with all the precious elements which define existence contained by a sincere assumption that it is finite. My poems are merely the assembled thoughts of a man who is deeply and profoundly in love with living. I have spoken on many occasions before audiences of young people, and what I have told them is that I hope deeply that they all find something in their lives, and I mean beyond their chosen profession, to be passionate about, something which will inspire their lives with yearning, something they will do for the unbridled joy of it, something they will create simply for the celebration of living. I believe it is possible for all of us that there is at least one thing which will, our lifelong, help bring our humanity 
into a sharp focus and make each day a revelation. I honestly believe that when my days come to a close, I will be able to say that I had that passion, that I lived life with all my might, and that I was grateful through all of it. This with all my heart, I hope for all of you. My reflections on the artists I have known has been tempered by the sadness that so many of them are no longer with us. In their passing, I have wondered about the nature of this mortality we must all share. Where does all that knowledge go, all that creative genius, that accumulated wisdom and virtuosity? Like any poet, any artist, I have always considered a posterity to what I have done. But a few years ago, as a dentist, well-worn and contemplating the dimming days of a long career, it became apparent to me that I had an obligation and perhaps a great obligation. It was incumbent on me to take what I had come to learn over a lifetime and make an earnest attempt to pass it along to those who were to follow. I began to believe that a new possibility lay in the lives of students and dictated by their desire for understanding and knowledge. Many of the words I have written are contained in books that will survive me. But it must be by one's acts that one might be remembered as a doctor. As I have been given much by my profession, it was now incumbent that I give of myself to my profession. I reflected on the many joys I came to know by my service to others as a doctor, yet to be a teacher of doctors might allow for a possibility beyond my comprehension. It did not take long for me to decide that this is where I needed to be, where my desires might find application. Late in 2008, I thought I might try teaching, and for nearly a year, I taught on Fridays with Dr. Lewis Brown in preclinical fixed prosthodontics and commuted back and forth to Long Island, New York, some 400 miles each week, so as to continue to care for my patients. As a measure of just how deeply I fell in love with teaching, I can tell you that in less than one year's time, I had sold my house, my practice, and left behind everyone and everything that had been familiar to me, save my dear wife, Karen, and two cats, and came to Boston University. It was the most radical thing I have ever done in my life and possibly the very wisest. After less than three years of teaching, my bliss has transcended all my anticipations. I leave our school at the close of each day, completely drained, completely exhausted, often with my mind in knots, and each night I cannot wait to get back. That is because of all of you. It might be others here more capable than I who will teach you the mechanical and scholarly aspects of what we do, the technique. I have done what I can in that regard as well. But more importantly, I've hoped to teach you how to apply thinking and allow yourselves to feel all the subtle wonders of this life, of this discipline, of what we must strive to do and be as doctors, as healers, as among those who have been entrusted to provide for the well-being of others and accomplish the relief of human disease and suffering. I wanted to teach you what I have learned about this profession of ours, but also about this living of ours, so precious, so confoundingly perfect. Surveys of patients of every sort have been asked what it is they like most about their doctors. The most common answer is pure and unambiguous. My doctor really cares about me. Anyone who comes to you to be consulted and treated will assume your knowledge and your skill. What they crave and what they also require is your caring, your empathy, your compassion, your humanity. It is not easy, for to be such a person, you must take risks and open your heart wide and expose your own depths to many things that will challenge and even deplete you at times. Still, you must never shy from this caring. Though it may test you and even ache and sting at times, it is the source of your truest effect and the thing which will make your own life blossom with meaning. To be this thing we profess to be, doctors, you must allow yourself to be needed. People will ask things of you that they will articulate in clear terms, but they will also need things of you they cannot easily express. It is these things that you must try to determine, to recognize, and respond to. 
The word profession derives from the words avow, affirm, or declare. We in this room who have taught you, we in this room who have loved you, your parents, your friends, and your teachers made a vow long ago to nurture your dreams. In the assuming of your professional title on this day, it must be now all of you who must make a vow. Keep that vow in a place in your heart, near the surface, where it can be expressed every day in every moment. You will not be remembered by how much you were enriched in your lifetime, but how many you have enriched and how much. You who have come to this day of accomplishment have demonstrated the necessary command of dentistry, no small triumph. For this, you will be highly recognized in your lifetime. But let them say of you something more, that you were compassionate, that you shared your time, that you listened, that you were earnest when attention was called for, a mentor when counsel was asked for, a source of solace when comfort was needed. It would be simplistic to say that this esteemed profession of ours involves the care of the dentition and its associated structures. A poet sees more than flesh and bone and teeth. The human mouth is so much more than that, for it is the means of our nutrition and sustenance, the way in which we draw from life the things we need to perpetuate life. With it, as tiny infants, we first attempt to gather and discern the world we encounter. Within its function is the expression of our tenderness, our passion, our pleasure, and our tribulation as well. From it, we have learned to make language, perhaps the one true manifestation of human distinction. With it, we make song and express our thoughts, our questions, our wonderment, our awareness, our anger, our anguish, our elation, and our conviction. From it comes a voice peculiar to each of us. It is the way we first greet one another by its unique and ardent expressiveness. It will be these things which will be consigned to your compassion your many skills, and your expertise. In our society, and in fact, in all the societies of mankind through the many years we call our history, there is no designation which exceeds that of doctor. It is a title conferred on only the finest among us, the most learned, the most accomplished, the most devoted, and the most trusted. In every discipline, the term doctor proclaims itself. It commands deference, deference and esteem. In that title lies the aspirations of all human beings. Doctors of every discipline exist to be the stewards of what is known and those who will design the paths to future knowing. Many things might be said of us, but to be called doctor needs little elaboration. But such regard necessarily comes with a commensurate responsibility and obligation. It comes with an expectation that anyone who is called doctor subscribes to the highest tradition of an ethic beyond reproach. The doctor, by accord, must be the exemplar, the one who ever expects even more from themselves than is expected by others. For the doctor, virtue must be its own reward. In that sense and practice, we show our respect for our patients as well as ourselves and our probity and pureness of purpose is the very integrity of our profession. In the deeds of each lies the repute of all. In the people we call doctor, we position our faith, find comfort for our fears, and trust our lives and the very well-being of our families and communities. Doctors are the vessels of all we know, the eminent hopes we hold for the human progress and the shared yearnings of humankind to better itself. All of you who sit here today surely now apprehend even more clearly the meaning of that word and the price which must be paid by anyone who comes to be so formally designated. For each of you have evinced that devotion and given those years and made those sacrifices requisite to the title to be bestowed upon you today. Your families and friends as well have come to feel the weight of that onus and shared those aspirations and challenges with you. This is a day to be noted and distinguished on behalf of all of you who share this room in this moment. Never forget that. None of you who have come to be lauded here today 
have come to this auspicious moment alone. <clears throat> no words of mine could express adequately the personal meaning of the very great privilege of this day, to be given the occasion to reflect upon the honor to have shared with you all a few strides along the path of your lives on a course which has held your most precious aspirations. I am certain that I speak for all the faculty and staff and the administration of the Boston University Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine when I say, even as we rejoice with you this day and marvel at your accomplishment, that it is hard to see you leave now, for we all here in this place have shared so much, struggled so much, and assuredly accomplished so very much, and we have done it together. But I too have learned much from all of you, and I understand now that this conclusion, this denouement, is the nature of teaching and the grand elegance of how our lives must proceed, the lives of students and of teachers. I have stood at many lecterns in my life in many countries and before many people. I can assure you all without equivocation that I have never before been so proud to stand at a lectern as I am in the noble confines of this hall, in this great university, on this stately occasion. But it is surely and simply because I am so very proud of all of you, proud to have called you my students, and now even more proud to call you each my colleague. <laughs> My life has been enriched by having known each of you. Know that I will miss each one of you. Home is the place where you have been nurtured, and by that virtue, we all hope that you will always think of this school as home. Don't ever wander so far as to forget how to find your way back to this place. Take all of your gifts, all of your accomplished skills, and do great things. You are needed. Several months ago, Dr. Jamili Pedro, who sits among you today, approached me with a special request. Could I write a poem for this year's graduates? I could only say that I would try. One morning, a few weeks later, as my wife Karen and I sat at our breakfast table, something came to me. I would like to make my conclusion by reading, for you, reading it for you all. It is offered with my sincere respects, my most earnest affections, and my congratulations. Passages. We've come from the far places where the sun lies heavy over the noon, where gelid winds fall over the shoulders of the mountain, where our suns settle upon our evenings, the night's dark always returning us the day. We have taken to the welkin airs, cut paths across novel landscapes, called back to home with our peculiar voices. Our skin is dark like earth, or fair as clouds, our hair and eyes black, or blonde and blue-green. Our shared wish only to arrive at this place evoked in a dream. Our names are so many. Our way's end begins here. Thank you all. <clears throat>